So far, we've worked with a single data frame and we've transformed it using dplyr functions. And in this video, we're going to work with multiple data frames that we want to bring together. The data that we're going to work with comes from Discover Magazine. They had an um, article last March on information on 10 women in science who changed the world. So here's the name of the 10 women that they listed in their list. And what we have done is we've taken the data on them and we've actually spread it across three spreadsheets, so three data frames that we bring into R. The first one is called Professions that has 10 rows, which has information on e each of the 10 of the women scientists featured in the article, and then we know their profession. So the name is Ada Lovelace, for example, and uh, she was a mathematician. We have Marie Curie, who was a physicist and chemist, so on and so forth. We have another data frame called dates, where we only have information on eight of these scientists. Now, obviously I could have looked up the rest of them on Wikipedia, but for the purposes of this um, video, what we're trying to exemplify is a situation where not all of the data frames might have information on all of the records you're interested in, which is a lot more closer to real than if we had data on every single person. Uh, so the dates data frame also has a name column and then uh, has a birth year and death year and the NAs here does not really mean unknown, it's that these particular scientists are uh, still living at the time of recording this video, um, and so that's why the, the death year is given as NA. Um, and the works data frame has information on nine of the 10 women data, uh, scientists who, and then we know what they're known for. for so for example, for Ada Lovelace, we have a uh, first computer algorithm. For Marie Curie, we have uh, things like th theory of radioactivity. Um, the desired output we have, we want, is uh, 10 rows, so one per each of the women scientists featured in the article, and then five columns, their name, profession coming from the first uh, data frame, birth year and death year coming from the second data frame, and what they're known for that comes from the third data frame. Um, and once again, the our inputs, these three data frames, share one um, variable in common. Each of them has a variable called name, and that's what we're going to use by default as the linking variable when we join these data frames. And then they also have additional information that we can bring in. And we know that they don't all have the same number of rows, although we don't yet know which uh, scientists are which missing in which, but we happen to know that the professions data frame has the complete information and the rest are missing uh, some of the scientists. So we're going to talk about joining these data frames next. And to join data frames using dplyr functions, we use a set of functions that are always of the format something join. So left join, right join, full join, semi join, so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them on this particular slide since we're going to exemplify them in the upcoming slides. But I did want to draw your attention to the fact that I ended this bullet list with a dot, dot, dot. These are not all of the join functions dplyr uh, makes available, but they're the ones that we're going to focus on in the first instance because uh, they're the ones that are probably most commonly used, especially when you're working with situations where you are working with flat data that you're joining two data frames at a time. So for the next slides, uh, in addition to the women scientists data frame, I also have a, two smaller data frames that I'm going to use in some of the illustrative examples. So imagine that I have a data frame called X that has a uh, uh, items one, two, and three, and then another data frame called Y that has items with IDs one, two, and four. So some in common and some that are different between the two data frames. If I was to do a left join of X and Y, where X is on the left, what happens is I get to keep all of the rows, so all of the items from my X data frame, and for any for which I have information in Y, they come along, but that fourth one that exists in Y but not in X basically disappears when I join them. So if I do the same thing with my women scientists data frames, where I start with the professions data frame that has information on all 10, and then left join the dates data frame, uh, what happens is 
I get all of the information from professions, and then I bring in the birth year and death year variables, but for two of the scientists that were missing in the dates data frame that happened to be Ada Lovelace and Marie Curie, I end up not having birth years and death years listed for them. The remainders, the information for them comes, and I also don't lose these rows because they existed in my professions data frame. Right join does exactly the same thing the other way around. So you might be thinking, why would I need a different function? Couldn't I just swap the order? Yes, you could just swap the order, but the reason why there is a different function is that if you're building these things in pipelines, you may wanna keep your data frames in a particular order. So sometimes you might need a right and sometimes you might need a left join. So in the small example we have, if I was to do a right join, I get to keep the rows from Y and for any of those rows for which I have information on X, I get them, but for the other ones, the number three uh, item, that one goes away. So similarly, if I do professions and dates data frames for my scientists, but I do a right join this time, I lose Ada Lovelace and Marie Curie for whom I didn't have any information on the dates data frame, but for the other ones, I get the uh, professions uh, profession information from the professions data frame. A full join means I get to keep all of my rows and wherever I was missing information, I just end up with NAs. So for my um, scientist data frames, remember dates and uh, works. So these two had, one of them had nine observations and the other one had eight, but they were not necessarily the same. Um, they didn't necessarily have information on all of the same scientists. So when I bring these two um, data frames together, I get the date information for the eight uh, scientists for whom that information was available. And then I get the known for information for uh, Ada Lovelace and Marie Curie from the works data frame. But then in the works data frame, I only had nine observations. So I was uh, missing what uh, she's known for, for Rosalind Franklin. So that it becomes an NA here. So I ended up with 10 uh, rows by happenstance because between the two of them, we were able to come back to the full sample that we started with. But for whichever ones, I don't have the information in the respective data frames, I end up with NAs. An inner join is basically doing an intersection. So saying only give me the rows for which I have data on both of the data frames. So if I do that with the dates and works, I end up with only seven that were in common between the two. And if I want to do a semi join, this is very similar to a um, um, inner join, except this time I am using the information from the second data frame to match up to my first data frame to see which rows to keep, but I'm not actually bringing that information in with me. So for example, if I do a semi-join for dates and then works, note that there is no work known for column here anymore. That column is gone, but what I do have is uh, the rows that are at the intersection of the two data frames. And finally, an anti-join is basically a subtraction. It gives you the rows in X that are not in Y, so if I was to do an anti-join for dates and works, I end up with the one scientist for whom I have the dates for birth year and death year, but I did not have information on what she's known for. Um, so that's Rosalind Franklin. Putting it all together, I would probably want to start with the professions data frame because I happen to know that that one has all of the rows that I need. And then I want to left join the dates so that I get the birth and death years for whoever I have that information for. So again, I'm keeping things at the 10 rows. And then I want to left join the works as well. So I get the known for column for the scientists that, for whom I have this information. So this is how I can get back to my 10 by 5 data frame that I showed you earlier as a desired output. 
and I did not have to specify that the matching should be done by the name because that was obvious to R since um, that is the only column that is in common between these uh, three data frames. But note that their names had to be spelled exactly the same way for this to work out. So I'm going to now give you two very short case studies to exemplify other situations where data joins might be relevant. The first one is very near and dear to my heart because this is how I start every single semester of teaching where I get student data from official records, but then also from self-reported data from students where we run a getting to know you survey. And on a daily basis, I'm trying to match up these data sets to figure out who filled out their survey, for whom I'm missing information from, and who may have filled out their survey but is no longer in the class so I can actually drop the information. So what I have is enrollment data. So this is official university enrollment records and also survey data. This is student provided info uh, that, that is missing students who never filled it out, but also including students who filled it out but may have dropped the class by the time I'm running my analysis. And what I want is I want survey information for all who are enrolled in the class. So not for those who have already dropped, but all who are for a given date enrolled in the class. Um, so the two pieces are enrollment data. So I have an ID number for my students. Let's say their names are Dave Friday, Hermione, and Sura Salvaria, Salvaria I think. Yes, Sura Salvaria. And I have survey information for uh, four students. It happens to be uh, Hermione, Sura, Peter, and Mark. But note that even though um, they're called name in both of the um, data frames, the way people have written their names are slightly different. For example, over here, I can see that for Sura, um, I have their full name in one of the data frames, but only their first name in the other one. If you think this is made up, unfortunately not. I'm constantly having to match information between data frames where people may be spelling things differently, but thankfully what I have here to help me is an ID number, which is a realistic situation when you're working with student data. You at least have some official ID number by which you can match things and not be caught by differences in spelling. And I also happen to have their usernames. Um, in the class we were asking for GitHub usernames, but these are the uh, Instagram handles for these bakers if you recognize their names. Um, so if I want to figure out who is still in class and uh, get their information, what I would do is I would start with the enrollment data frame, since that's the truth for any given day, the official records, and I'll say left join the data for me by the ID column. And I'm specifying which column to join by, because if we go back to our data frames, remember we actually had two columns with um, who had names in co common, but the name column um, has information in not exactly the same format. So what I want to tell R is that don't try to match by name, just match by ID. So if I want to be specific about that, I can use the by argument in the join functions, and then I feed to it a character string, which has the name of the column that I want to match by. So take the enrollment data set and left join the survey data to it. So I end up with the three students who are enrolled in the course as of today. I have their names coming from the first data set and the second one. So R uses the dot X and dot by by default to say first and the second uh, data sets that were in the join function. And then I get this additional information from the survey, uh, their username. So what now I can do is I can go try to uh, figure out what this NA is. So if I want a list of students for whom I have their survey missing, I can say Take the enrollment data set and then anti-join it to the survey. So it will give me the difference between the enrollment and the survey. So those who are in enrollment but not in survey. So I got to chase down Dave and try to get his uh, username. 
I also can take a look at who dropped the course. So that is saying start with the survey and anti-join it to enrollment. So these are people who have taken the time to fill out the survey, maybe in the first couple days of class, then decided they had something better to do with their lives and dropped the course and are no longer on our enrollment records. So I might be curious to see who they are, but then I'll probably drop them from any further records. Maybe I'll you know kick them out of my organization or something like that on GitHub. So that's what I do this sort of join functions very regularly during the first couple weeks of a semester. Another place where this might be is where you have data spread, spread across multiple uh, databases. So we're going to give an example of grocery sales for that. But again, to keep things simple, I'm keeping it down to just a couple uh, customer sales. So what I have are purchases where I have one row per customer per item. Uh, listing any purchases they made. And I also have another data frame with prices where I have one row per item in the store and listing their prices. And what I want to calculate ultimately is the total revenue I've made from my sales. So my purchases data frame has a row per customer per item they purchased. So customer ID one purchased bread, milk, and banana. And customer ID number two purchased milk and toilet paper. In the prices data frame, I have prices on everything in my store. It happens to be some special store where we sell very exclusive items. I only sell avocado, banana, bread, milk, and toilet paper. So for the customers who bought things, I know the prices for things they've bought. I also have avocado that nobody bought, but it happens to live in my prices data frame. So how would I go about doing this calculation? Well, first I would, uh, start with the purchases uh, data set, and then I wanna left join the prices so that I can see for each item that was purchased, what was the price for it? And then once I have this information, I can simply use a summarize function that I've learned earlier. Now that I have data in a single data frame, I can use one of those single frame, uh, single data frame verbs that I've learned earlier to say, just sum up the values in the price column. And so my total revenue is say five pounds and 75 pence. Um, I can also do something like revenue per customer, and all I need to do for that is to add a group by layer right before the summarize. So now I know how much money was spent by customer ID one and customer ID two. So in this example, we um, try to in these both of these um, actually case studies, I tried to exemplify very realistic situations where data might live in separate data sets or databases or data frames. And first you need to bring these things together so that you can provide further insights into your data. In the student example, I did this with um, trying to figure out who is in the class and who is not. And in the grocery sales example, we actually did some calculations based off of the single data frame that we constructed.